The crash that sent a school bus and its students rolling off the road yesterday was sudden, but it was not particularly a surprise, considering what we have learned about the trucking company involved in that collision. Four people are still being treated at hospitals. 25 have been released since that Greeley school bus on a way back from Elich's was hit by a truck. The truck driver, 36-year-old William Carroll from Lilton, has been charged with careless driving. I want to know investigative reporter Kevin Vaughn has found that federal investigators had already questioned that trucking company's safety record. It was a truck operated by Road Safe Traffic Systems Incorporated whose driver was blamed for that crash. But long before that truck drifted across the center line, sending the bus into a skid and rollover, the company's safety record was already being questioned. Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration documents show the company has a conditional safety rating. That's like being on probation. Why? The past two years, the company's trucks were pulled out of service at rates higher than the national average. And the company's drivers? They were also pulled out of service at rates higher than the national average. Raising concerns for one Colorado expert heavily involved in this issue. It clearly shows that there is a higher safety risk um, right now. And Former Colorado State Patrol Chief Scott Hernandez now works to make sure commercial vehicle safety inspections are uniform across the country. The regulations are there um, specifically to make carriers safe, um, to prevent what happened yesterday. What happened yesterday should, should not have occurred. So in terms of what happens for this company going forward? The feds are going to investigate and they're mm -hmm. going to look at the factors that played into this wreck and then they're going to compare that to what led to this conditional safety rating. And the big trouble could be if there are things they've been told to do or not do that were factors in this accident, mm -hmm. they could lose their Department of Transportation license potentially, which would put them out of business. Wow. We're a long way from knowing if that's going to happen, but it's possible. All right, Kevin Bond, thank you very much. The Longmont Housing Authority's new leader only has to avoid unconstitutional searches of her tenants, and she will have outperformed her predecessor. Jillian Baldwin is coming in from the Gary, Indiana Housing Authority. She replaces Michael Reese, who was asked to resign after he mocked reporters' coverage of the wireless or the warrantless searches, rather, conducted by his housing authority and Longmont Police. Republican State Representative Tim Leonard is comparing Women's March participants to Nazi militiamen who tortured Jews and guarded concentration camps. The Republican from Evergreen posted on Facebook a few days ago saying, quote, the insanity and incoherency of the Women's March radicals has to be pitied. He went on to say, quote, they are in the political arena just to cause chaos, like Hitler's brown shirts. The brown shirts, if you're not familiar, were a militia that supported Adolf Hitler, terrorizing opponents of the Third Reich. Messages that I left for Representative Leonard today have not yet been returned. Spent a lot of time, and rightly so lately, talking about the men and women on the front lines fighting wildfires across our state. Good number of them come from departments here in the metro area. And as fires have grown in this dry season, so too have fire departments. Our Steve Steger talked with the department that is growing the fastest. On a busy day for Metro firefighters this week when a recycling fire filled the northern sky with a cloud of smoke and a hay truck fire tangled traffic to the south, crews from South Metro Fire were on both scenes. It got us thinking about how big that agency has become. South Metro Fire Rescue right now is about 198 square miles. Eric Hurst is the South Metro Public Information Officer. He speaks for the third largest fire department in the state of Colorado. And in about five months, He'll be speaking for the second largest department in the state. January 1st of 2019, South Metro Fire Rescue and Littleton Fire Rescue are unifying into one fire protection district. South Metro has come a long way. From this amazing promotional video from 1990, it was for, cue the killer guitar solo. Castlewood was a, a name that preceded South Metro. Since Castlewood became South Metro, the department has grown through several mergers, most notably with Parker Fire in 2008 and Cunningham Fire on the first of this year. Mergers seem to be the name of the game in a growing state. It all comes down to, is there a benefit to the taxpayer? Like we said, right now South Metro sits at third biggest in Colorado. It'll soon be second. Denver Fire is at the top. They recently merged with Inglewood Fire. West Metro is fourth. They most recently merged with with Wheat Ridge in 2016. Is bigger better? Hearst says yes, because bigger departments can do more. 
The bigger the fire department is and the more resources we have, the better we can handle those emergencies. And as the state continues to grow and fill in empty space between towns, he says, we may see more of it. If we were to just start over and say we need a fire department to cover this south metro area, what would that look like? Would it look like one or would it look like a half a dozen? We would say it needs to be one. That just makes sense. For next, I'm Steve Steger. So Lilton and South Metro will merge in January. And South Metro says while there aren't any other big mergers in the works for them, there's always talk going on about it. There's a bit of an underground mystery in Adams County right now. How chemicals found in firefighting foam have turned up in the drinking water supply. Federal environmental health workers from the EPA are now getting involved to test wells in the area of 270 and Quebec. You certainly do not want to be drinking the untreated stuff that has been found in the systems of South Adams County Water and Sanitation. They say that they have been able to treat the water that is going out to their 50,000 or so customers, so that water is safe. The obvious concern now are private wells. When we find something that we uh, of a concern like this, we, we notify the health department. The concern is uh, we are treating for that chemical here and, re and removing it uh, to levels below the health advisory. But the concern is with other people that may be using wells that are not on our system and supplied by water by our district. The issue has caused the shutdown of three of that water district's 12 wells. State and federal health investigators are still looking for the source of the problem and we're told that the county health department may begin testing of private wells next week. Remember that feeling when you were able to drive for the first time? That freedom from your parents till you realize that it's their car and you need to get it and you home safely. A recent high school graduate from Broomfield is still trying to get her learner's permit. Marshall Zellinger explains. Might be a good time to do this, I guess. Alicia Heater has an extensive card collection. Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon. I actually want to sell some of my cards. Where she wants to sell her cards requires the use of a car. First place I want to go is uh, one of the card shops around here. I really like the one down in Aurora, the co coin cards and comics. The problem is, is my daughter has been trying to get a learner's permit and the DMV won't let her. Alicia was born in China. Her birth certificate says so, just like it says certificate for foreign-born child. We've used this birth certificate for school. She's used it to get a job. We used it to get a social security card. She's worked. You know, there's never been an issue with any of these documents now until she wants to learn to drive. Alicia went to the DMV to make sure she had the right documents for a permit. They highlighted certain documents that we needed to bring, which we did. I've now talked to four employees of the same DMV office. Each one of them have given us a certain or a different criteria of what we need. Alicia needs to prove her identity, date of birth, name, and lawful presence. A passport can do all that. But because hers is expired, it does not prove lawful presence. The standards are in statute. We can't circumvent the law for any customer. Um, but we do strive to try and make the experience as painless as possible. Since 2014, the DMV has a separate process for those here illegally to get a driver's license. But Alicia is here legally. To prove it, the DMV needs to see a green card or certificate of citizenship which her mom put away in a safe deposit box after she was adopted. How am I not legal if the legal documents say that I'm legal? That certificate of citizenship that Alicia's mom has in the safe deposit box, she almost didn't get one because she says it wasn't a requirement in 2000 during the adoption. She can go get it, and she's just concerned, Kyle, that she'll be told she's still not providing enough information when she talks to the fifth person. Me, I just failed parallel park three times, <laughs> you know? I mean, and that was on me. This one, let's hope it gets straightened out for her. Thank you, Marshall. May I make a recommendation where we point you towards something that is not ours but is worth your time? Stephen Myers knows how to tell a good story. He was a reporter for the Colorado newspaper until he was laid off. He went to work as a mail carrier, and today, in a fascinating tweet thread, he takes us behind the scenes of what might seem like a mundane job. He talks about how genuinely excited people are to see a mail carrier. He talks about how he felt bad delivering sweepstakes mail to poor neighborhoods. And he lets us in on the internal politics at the Postal Service that surpassed any newsroom bickering. Stephen also has a new job. His tweets are on the next Facebook page. You have a beautiful weekend on tap. Mm, on tap. 
Hey, lay off. It's my Friday. I'm thirsty. We take a road trip to northern Wyoming, where a small city was accidentally growing marijuana. And a young Coloradan is among the best in the world at calling one particular animal. Think you know? That's next. and we're staring right into the weekend and something for everyone in this weekend forecast. Yes, tomorrow we're back to hot, dry weather with temperatures in the 90s. So tomorrow's going to feel like the summer day and then Sunday, cooler weather with a chance for showers. Today's high right about where we should be for this time of year. It actually felt cooler all day as temperatures held in the 80s until about the last hour or so. Thunder showers coming off the foothills are not holding together. Threat for heavy rain continuing in southwestern Colorado with a flash flood. Watch out 416 burn scar, San Miguel County in and around Durango. A lot of heavy rain and threat smooth mudslides that may impact travel there. See some strong storms firing along this frontal boundary, but as high pressure kind of migrates westward, it cuts off the flow of moisture for Denver. There'll be scattered showers in the high country and keep an eye out for lightning if you're hiking or camping. A little bit of fog on the plains early tomorrow morning, but basically a sunny, dry Saturday and then some changes on Sunday. Dry tonight, maybe a rumble of thunder in the foothill areas this evening with lows in the 60s. Back to 90 to 95 degrees with lots of sunshine Saturday, cooler Sunday and Monday, good chance of rain from storms. And that trend continues into Tuesday before we crank up the heat again, back to the mid 90s for Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. And earlier there were raindrops on this camera lens. But what a beautiful day for a drive in the high country, Kyle. Thank you, Kathy. The most Colorado thing we saw today is a small town parks department in Wyoming that was accidentally growing marijuana. You got to get real high in Wyoming to find this place. Powell, it is near Cody. It's about 30 minutes south of the Wyoming Montana border. Powell's Parks Department maintains the planters that line the main part of town. They, they water them, they prune them, and they notice something popping up amidst those flowers. A weed of sorts. The Parks Department called the police, and so did next producer today. How did they figure out that it was marijuana growing? Seen enough t-shirts, I guess. Did you guys think it was funny? I'm hesitant to say that. Police Chief Roy Eckhart is hesitant because he said he didn't want to encourage any more of this tomfoolery in his town. He sounds like a man who's hot on the trail of some suspects. Powell, Wyoming's fugitive ganja growers. It would be pure speculation on this point, but the time that would pass for them to be able to grow to that, you know, six, eight inches tall. Uh, they started from a seed, which is my estimation, if somebody walked by and stuck one in the middle of each planter. That would be about the time frame that our college students would have been leaving. Is that profiling? Probably. Is he right? Probably. But Powell, Wyoming is now on high alert for clandestine cannabis in Parks Department planters. In fact, the chief tells us he personally checked all the planters in front of the, the police department. All clear. No pot in those pots. We're about to meet a six-year-old with many talents, but only one that's ranked her among the world's best. People think I'm amazing just by doing it with only my voice. You haven't just crossed a line, you've crossed a lane. A New West standoff today in Denver. And your good news includes a child send-off for a very good dog. Next. About a month until elk hunting season starts and there is a six-year-old girl in Fruta who is as excited as if this were Christmas. Our Ann Herps made the long drive to meet her. Let me get around. It's hard to draw a straight line. I'm drawing it huge. Between all of Ava King's hobbies. Yeah. I have an arrowhead necklace. I love Bambi. Woof! 
I can lift up myself with only my hands. This six-year-old has so many interests. I'm um, about 40,000. It's really tough to keep up. Darn near impossible, actually. I can even do a cartwheel. But one of Ava's hobbies stands out. And hunting with my dad. Hunting speaks to her. It's pretty much all I want to do. And it speaks loudly. <coughs> Ava watched YouTube videos to learn how to use her voice <coughs> and a few other tools <coughs> to call elk. Because I wanted to help my dad hunt. Her dad, Sean, is depicted here in shock. I need a dry skull tea. And here in real life. Very much daddy's girl. <laughs> People say a little kid can go a long ways. All the way to Salt Lake City <laughs> to compete in the World Elk Calling Championships. This is my plaque from my elk calling competition. I got fourth place in the world. She said that was funner the Knott's Berry Farm. It's pretty cool to me. The ever conscientious Ava. There's a bug on you. Is prepping to help her dad call an elk this hunting season. <coughs> Though when the elk hear the duo's favorite meal, they might want to run the other way. <coughs> kind of like Ava's mom does. They love, that's like their tradition is to share the heart and I, I don't want any part of it. <laughs> the heart is really, really good. My dad cooks it so well. She'll just eat it straight out of the pan in the King House. The saying is like father, like daughter. I think he's great. And that's all right with them. I think he's the best dad in the earth. For next, this is Ann Herbst. Best dad in the world. <laughs>